My name is Jeff Bauer. I'm the chief engineer for Vahana uh, for Airbus Urban Mobility. I'm sitting next to our Alpha 2 prototype for Vahana, which is an electric vertical takeoff and landing uh, air taxi demonstrator. So it's designed to carry a, a single passenger or multiple passengers in, in future iterations uh, for inner city transportation, taking off vertically, transitioning to an efficient cruise flight, and getting people to their destination. The project started in uh, early 2016, and uh, it was a very quick uh, development process. We had our, our critical design review in November of 2016. Started receiving our first full-scale uh, airframe structure in mid-2017. Vehicle started ground testing by the end of 2017, uh, and our first flight was in early 2018. And since then, we've been continuing to, to flight test, expand the flight envelope, uh, test, test systems on the airplane, and performance. Uh, A-cubed, the Airbus uh, Silicon Valley Innovation Center, um, was started to really uh, disrupt Airbus and, and the rest of the industry. So our project was started to look at urban mobility, um, where we focused, I, I think one of the areas that our thinking has changed a little bit is in the maybe the size of the airplane. Initially, we looked at a single passenger concept because that's uh, most taxi rides today are single passenger. Uh, but it also made a lot of sense for a demonstrator because the single passenger is kind of the smallest vehicle to meet the requirements that uh, you might need to. Um, so we had we set out the requirements based on on being able to do flight testing. So it was sufficient range and endurance to demonstrate what we needed to. Uh, there was a desire to keep the, the footprint of the vehicle very compact. So that's why it's a, a tandem wing configuration. Length is about the same as the width. For the urban transport mission, uh, speed and range are important to provide value to customers. Um, so that pretty much necessitates going to wingborne flight to reach the lift to drag ratios that are, are needed to, to get the necessary range on your battery power alone. So for these types of vehicles, you're pretty fixed in what your disc loading and your wing loading need to be to be efficient enough for battery powered flight. So then the question is, how do you, how do you locate those discs and wings while keeping the footprint small, keeping the weight down, etc. We looked at some more conventional tilt wings. Um, we've looked at lift plus cruise type configurations. Um, so some of our thinking on this was informed by past projects that members on the team had worked on. When you're designing an airplane like this, you really have to converge all the systems at once. So given a payload requirement and a range requirement, you really need to, you need to iterate the size of the battery to meet that. And then the airframe is sized to hold all that. And it's an iterative process. And that's kind of where we ended up, <laughs> where we are now. Uh, this, this vehicle weighs about 725 kilograms or 1,600 pounds. It's about one third batteries. So very similar to a long range commercial aircraft. The disc loading is very similar to a light helicopter. So it's a, well, maybe a medium helicopter. It's, if I'm trying to remember off the top of my head, I think it's 50 kilograms per meter squared. We tried to focus on mostly off the shelf technology because we had a very fast development timeline. So we were trying not to, to push all the technologies to places that would take a long time. Um, our first flights were done with commercial off the shelf uh, motors and inverters. And then we moved to these uh, custom motors by a company called Magical that were specific to our, our requirements. So it's all, all about achieving high uh, power density. So kilowatts per kilogram for a full integrated system. So not just the electric motor, but the motor inverter and any other uh, systems that are needed by the motors, cooling systems, uh, extra inductors or capacitors, for instance. Uh, speed was very important for this project. So we tried to execute quickly. So we leveraged a lot of uh, vendors that were in the US that could do rapid prototyping. Um, so the, the companies we worked with that are, are public, so there's Magical who developed our electric motors. Um, Airbus Defense and Space is one area we did work with Airbus. They built our battery packs. The composite airframe was uh, designed by a company called Flighthouse Engineering in Portland and built by a, a company they work with called Composites Universal Group, so rapid very rapid uh, construction of the main airframe. So in the nose, uh, one of the most prominent things you'll see first is the air data boom sticking out. And then below that, we have our sense and avoid system. So there is a uh, high resolution camera for detecting airborne obstacles in the flight path. Uh, you'll see a 
the uncovered ray dome. So there's a small radar there. And then uh, underneath, there's a LIDAR that is used for evaluating the landing zone to see if there's any obstacles uh, where the aircraft is landing. Then we have uh, our first, our canard, so forward wing that has uh, four electric motors on it, each with a variable pitch propeller. So the wing tilts and propellers uh, can be actuated as well. And we have elevators on the canard, ailerons on the main wing. Then we have our next, our cockpit. Um, so concept with a actuated canopy. Skids, uh, skid landing gear. So conventional like a helicopter. You'll notice there's pretty large fairings on the aft landing gear. And that's for the cruise handling qualities. So adds helps add some Dutch roll damping to the vehicle. Then our main wing in the back, uh, which is very similar to the canard. So four motors and identi identical motors and propellers. The wing cord's a little bit bigger. And you'll note the winglets as well uh, that help improve the cruise efficiency and also provide for good lateral directional stability and control and ailerons on the rear surface. Batteries enter through the back of the vehicle uh, and they're kind of on the sides on either side of the pilot. Uh, so Alpha-1, the first flight was in January 31st of 2018. So that uh, was just a short hover flight. So all of the flight testing has followed a very uh, dedicated and slow envelope expansion. So we started with simple hover flights, started then to do hover air taxis, so demonstrating um, yaw performance, low speed maneuvering. And then we've slowly expanded by tilting the wings uh, farther and farther and going to, to higher speeds. Uh, a lot of flight control system testing, especially, um, so the, the transition uh, maneuver, basically optimizing that. Uh, and then today we're, we're continuing to do more performance testing and improving the transition maneuver. To date, uh, all of our flight tests has occurred in Pendleton, Oregon. It's one of the FAA's designated test sites for UAS. Uh, we've conducted over 80 flights to date. Uh, total flight time is a little bit over six hours. We have a dedicated flight test team, uh, some of whom are here today, uh, <laughs> and they're, they're responsible for keeping the aircraft in flying condition, doing the flight test plans, briefings, etc. Then we have engineers uh, in a bunch of different disciplines that are in the flight control room during flights, and they monitor critical parameters for their subsystems. So we have an avionics engineer, flight controls engineer, propulsion engineer. Uh, that monitor systems in real time. So in the flight control, uh, flight control room, we have about six engineers, and overall the team's about 30. The, the test range is about five kilometers by, by three kilometers, so we have visual observers uh, stationed to, to see it, so we don't need a chase. We've done a couple of flights with chase, either drones or uh, helicopters. So most of the flights to date are up to about 10 minutes long, so five to 10 minutes for most of them. We've expanded all the way to cruise flight at 100 knots. So we've demonstrated our transition to from hover to fully wingborne cruise flight uh, and continuing to expand, expand the envelope in terms of uh, range endurance. We're restricted to, I wanna say it's 700 feet altitude. So our, our certificate of authorization limits us uh, in altitude and the extents of the range that we have to stay in. Design specification was to fly up to 5,000 foot uh, pressure altitude in 95 F uh, temperature. Um, so I actually don't know the maximum temperature that we've flown at, uh, but it's probably in the 90s. And we've flown in January when it's been below f around freezing. Uh, so it's, it's demonstrated a pretty wide range there. We, we don't fly in active precipitation usually, and our, our wind limits aloft are on the order of 20 knots. So we. We'd like to think of it as we use the pitch angle of the propellers as a trim setting. And for the high bandwidth control, we use the electric motor, which are you know, torque on demand. We have very high bandwidth control. So the, they're RPM controlled at a given airspeed, but the, the pitch changes as we change airspeed and as the wings tilt. So those are all, all scheduled with the wing tilt angles. Uh, so it's capable of a transition, more or less, in this attitude. Most of our flight tests to date, if you see the videos, you'll note it pitches over uh, quite a bit at first. So we're working on, on improving that. Um, but it's really a, a matter of when you start the, the wing tilt. The most difficult axis to control in hover is the yaw axis. 
And we really have three, three main means of controlling the yaw. So the first is the torque of the electric motors. So just how most drones today fly, they change the speed of the motors rotating different directions. Uh, we also have our control surfaces that lie in the propeller wakes, and we can get a fair amount of control authority from that. And then in hover, our wings are not perfectly vertical, but they're angled out a little bit. So the, th the thrust from the propellers also creates a, a yawing moment. So combining all of those together, we have a, a piece of software that we call our, our control allocation that determines how to optimally use all of the actuators to get the most authority for the vehicle. It, it can glide when it's in this, this configuration. It's not capable of auto rotation. Uh, the, the rotors don't have enough inertia to enable that. The redundancies really come from the multiple, multiple motors, multiple batteries, and how they're interconnected. And yeah, all work together. Fewest number of motors it can fly on, and it, it is capable of flying on six motors. The, the initial, I, I think the biggest difference is if these are going to be carrying, or when these are carrying passengers, safety is paramount. So we really need to demonstrate the reliability and redundancies of the vehicle, uh, build a safety case just like we do in commercial aviation today. We have a, a single motor test stand in Santa Clara. All of the vehicle uh, ground testing has occurred up in Pendleton. So there's a test pad where we can clamp the vehicle to the ground and run. We ran the, the airplane through its paces before it ever flew. So there's a, a few parameters that have a really large influence on the noise of these vehicles. Uh, they're primarily the disc loading, so how much weight per unit area of the propeller discs, the tip speed of the propellers, so the closer they get to the speed of sound, the, the, a lot louder they are. And you can do a little bit on blade shaping uh, to minimize interactions, interaction effects. Similar to a drone in hover, and then in cruise flight, it's it's very very quiet. It's uh, so the electric electric motors are almost silent compared to an internal combustion or turbine engine. So there's really the possibility for these vehicles to be extraordinarily quiet. We're Airbus Urban Mobility, but we're still housed at A Cubed. So we work very closely with our our colleagues at A Cubed, and we technically report to the urban mobility division. So there's lots of interesting areas to work on for these vehicles. So we're looking we're always looking for Flight controls engineers, aerodynamicists, uh, aeroacoustics is very important. Uh, people with experience on electric motors, so electric motors and batteries. Uh, then there's you know some of the more traditional aerospace structures and composites, um, flight testing. So it, it, it's it's a it's like any other aerospace company or project. We really need people a diverse diverse background. So a -Cube still exists. So it's the innovation center for Silicon, for Airbus in Silicon Valley. So we host projects that are uh, kind of advanced development projects for the company. And there's been a, a host of them that have graduated, as we say, to, to move on to, to work with the rest of Airbus. So there is a, a heli there's a helicopter ride sharing company called Voom that started in a -Cube. So today you can book a helicopter ride in Mexico City or Sao Paulo on an app. Uh, there's a program we had called Altiscope that is now called Airbus UTM. So they're working on unmanned traffic management and eventually un traffic management for vehicles like these. Uh, and there's been a, a number of others. But it's been a, a good evolution. So early on, we, were, we had a mandate to run very fast to, to make this project happen quickly. So we were insulated from Airbus where we needed to be but we still had design reviews with experts from all of the divisions that proved very helpful. Um, so we were glad to be part of the Airbus family at that point. Airbus has two eVTOL demonstrators, so Vahana, which has been flying for the last year and a half, and there's a, another project called City Airbus that is undergoing flight testing in Germany. And uh, for the last few months, we've been working very closely with our colleagues from City Airbus and others within Airbus to uh, called our vehicle convergence team to start planning the next uh, production vehicle for Airbus.